so we've talked a lot today about the spirit and what it is. And we've tried to really construct how we can understand it and, and really simple ways that it works in our life. So right now what we want to do is we kind of want to pare that down a little bit. We want to talk about common errors. And, and that sounds really critical. And we don't mean it that way. Maybe a better way to put it is misunderstandings or misinterpretations of how the spirit works in our life, right? Because we've talked about it at a little bit of a high level. So now we're going to get a little bit more rubber meets the road. One of the things that I tend to encounter and that my, my friends tend to encounter in our lives is a misconception that the spirit manifests itself exclusively or if not exclusively, heavily or primarily in miracles, right? So by miracle, what we mean is some kind of like supernatural act, right? So like a superhuman act, a visible phenomenon, an experience like medical healing, something that transcends your everyday interaction, right? That's that's beyond the regular everyday laws of nature, hence supernatural. So we, we've heard phrases and we've heard stories, right? And we've heard phrases like, blessed are those who have not seen yet believed, right? The healed by faith. Uh, we've heard of the snake handlers in Appalachia, right? You know, like I will be cured of this poisonous snake bite by not doing this. And they are because they have the faith. And, and, and I'm not trying to knock on those. But what I want to do is I want to really put it in its proper context. And then we can talk a little bit about the validity of those things. But the purpose of miracles is to glorify God. It's not to serve as a proof for God's existence. Now, that isn't to say that they cannot that a miracle can't be used to prove God's existence. But historically in the biblical sense, we haven't really seen it that way. In the Old Testament, we saw some interactions of God to prove his strength and majesty, but generally they were in competition with other God figures. So a great example of this is uh, it's Elisha or Elijah. I always get this confused. When he calls Elijah. down the fire, it's Elijah. Yeah, Elijah, when he calls down the fire on Baal, right? Like that's an example of that in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, though, and I, I think a great example and a great clarifying point is explicitly found in the book of John. Now, in some translations of the word John, you will not see the word miracle. You'll see the word sign because the Greek word for the word miracle that John uses is also synonymous or similar to the word sign. Now, it just depends on which translation you're reading, but you'll see that quite a bit. And I heard an evangelist say it this way, and it it's flawed, but I think it's still really good. He would do this whole sermon series over the week of a revival. And he would always end and he would just talk about the sign and what signs do. And so after illustrating the message of Jesus, he would talk about the signs and how they illustrate an aspect of God or our interactions with God, right? It would just kind of illustrate something about the relationship or interaction of his place in our world. So these signs at the very end, what they do is they're signifiers, right? They, they point to something, they illustrate something, they show something. Um, they're not, how do I say this? they're not there to be the only way God interacts. They point to how God interacts more consistently, if that makes sense. At least that's the way he illustrated it. Now, I don't know if I agree with that in its totality, but it is a good way, I think, to understand, or at least it's a good place to start when you're trying to talk about this. So they, they point to aspects of God as illustrated by Jesus and his miracles. Uh, in the modern days, I think we could say they point to maybe a characteristic of God. I don't know if I really fully buy, buy this, but... I've been thinking about it since we kind of thought we were in the Holy Spirit. So let's talk about some modern miracles. Let's just give some quick examples. We've had the person in our church who gets really, really sick. And then we've had the Sunday morning, Sunday night, whatever day of the week it is experience where everybody goes down to the altar, that person goes in the middle, and we pray over them. And the good news is, is that shortly after, whether it's allegedly same day or a couple of weeks later, you know, they're healed, right? Mm. And we talk about that as God's work of healing. That is what we talk about as supernatural. Now, what I would say is that would illustrate to me that God is, is beyond nature. He's not constrained by our natural laws. But that isn't the primary way <laughs> in which he works in our lives, right? This isn't the say-all, be-all. This is not his primary communication. He communicates to us in a myriad of sm small, little, hard-to-notice, unsexy ways, right? Just and that's a really weird way to put it, but it, it doesn't have flash, doesn't have pizzazz. It's not a 30 foot Jesus like Ben illustrated earlier. It's simple, it's small. Mm -hmm. Yes, the, I, I would at least leave the door open to say, yes, these things can happen, miracles can happen. But I, I don't know if I would be so strong to say ever that they're one of the primary modes of his communication. In fact, I think that the rarity of the miracles is what, if, if they do happen, lends themselves to the credence of their validity, right? Because they don't happen often. I think if they happened often, we'd have this really weird solipsistic game of like, 
give me a sign, God. Does God give us a sign? <laughs> and then and then you get in this like really weird self-fulfilling prophecy. Is he speaking? Is he not? Is he mad? Is he not? And I, I, I just don't think that's fair. Whereas if I think we understand God's work properly, and we talk, like as Rick said, his ever presence, like the spirit's like constant presence in our life and being everywhere. I think that's a much more healthy way to do it. And then we can maybe look at the miracle case by case and say, that's okay. That's not. Does that, does that make sense before I keep going and digging myself in a hole? Yeah, I think that makes sense. Okay, good. Because like the third try was really hard. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I think it makes sense. I also think that even in your construal of miracles there, um, there is a potential response to a question yet unasked, which would be, why doesn't God just do miracles all the time for everyone, every day, everywhere? And part of what you said is a response to that question, right? So this is um, uh, sort of a, a piece of this bigger question about the problem of evil, right? Like, why does God allow these bad things to happen to these people? And, and the reverse is like, question can be like, why does he heal some and not all? But this isn't an absolute answer, but it gives us a glimpse into maybe why God doesn't heal every single person or doesn't do miracles on every single case. Because if that were the case, uh, it would it would sort of, well, I don't know how you said it, but it would kind of lose its luster, right? And there, there's a sense in which the miracle becomes so normal to you. <laughs> What'd you say? It would become a law of nature by default because right. it would be so, the way the universe functions. Yeah, and so if you take just a minute as a person with an imagination, I, I don't have a very great imagination, but you can sort of think about a world in which everyone was healed of every illness that they ever got or every injury that they ever, you know, came about to, uh, that would be a very weird, weird world. And you might wonder, is that the kind of world where more people would believe in God or fewer people would believe in God? You might find more people like believing that there is a God, but I don't know that there, that it's necessarily the case that in that kind of world, more people will come to a, a faith saving relationship with God. Um, so some people say, well, you know what, if God was real, he would heal everyone. He would cure every miracle. And I think that there's something here in what you said that gives us, uh, raises some pause to think whether or not that would be a better world where he cured everyone and healed every, healed every injury. Yeah. I mean, at some point, you know, I, I had an argument with somebody in college, uh, is a really good friend of mine and a really great guy. And, and he looked at me and Alex was like, you know, I can't rule what we're arguing about, so I don't have context for it, but I'll, I'll say what he said. Cause I think it's really good. He goes, I, one of the things that, it was the Odyssey. That's what it was. It was the problem of evil. He goes, one of the things that really gives me comfort, he's like, is the presence of evil in the world for God's existence. He's like, mm -hmm. and for my own moral free agency. And I was like, whoa, that's a heavy sentence. Please unpack that, Alex. And he goes, okay. So what he was saying was simply this, like if, and this is what I was trying to articulate in a very poor way. He said, if we lived in a world, like Rick said, where everything is sealed and perfect, our, our understanding of, of reality and nature as is would be what we understand here in our in our current world is good all the time, but that wouldn't be good. That would just be reality as it is, right? That would just be the state of things full stop. So what Rick is, I think what you're saying, Rick, or what you're arguing for is that it's, there's a possibility of it being a better version of the world for our moral free agency, because we live in a world where there is some level of suffering. So we understand, I don't know, I guess the good that comes from some of those acts. Is that what you're, am I butchering your argument? I probably am. Uh, I think you're saying maybe more than what I wanted to say, but it's not yeah. unrelated. Um, okay. It, some of it just depends on how we define whether or not a world is better or worse. But yeah. I think in from God's perspective, a better world is one where more people come to a loving relationship with him. Yeah. And whether or not we give the specific case argument that you just gave for why more people would come to a relationship with him in that world, namely because in a world with evil, people would be able to see the good, something like that. That's one way to think about why more people would come to a saving relationship with God. But I wasn't making that specific argument. I was only just suggesting that when you think about a world where all injuries were taken care of and every problem was taken care of, you can kind of imagine why that world might actually produce fewer true believing Christians. Now, like I said, you, you might give a specific argument for why in that world it produces more right. or less people, which might be this kind of argument you're giving. But I was leaving it open to whether or not there were different kinds of arguments you could give okay. that would support the idea that in that world, fewer people would come to faith. Yeah, no, I think that's really good. And I, and I think that's actually a great jumping off point. And uh, I have to credit Ben on this one for this quote. 
But I think ultimately what we're all trying to say, and, and don't let me put words in your mouth, guys, so definitely tell me if I'm off here, is that because of these things, right, because of these reasons we've laid out for quite some time, uh, that the best evidence is not a miracle for God's existence, right? It's it's the work of his followers. Like the best evidence for the work of the Holy Spirit is is this people that he's working on in our interaction in the world and the way we're transformed in the living of our lives. So Ben, do you, do you want to read this Frank Moore quote? Because I just feel like you should since you found it and yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'd, I'd actually like to back up just a just a little bit to to frame it, and I'm not trying to double you know against what you're no. what you're saying. It just reminded me you guys were talking about it reminded me of a church I once attended that was a very uh, Pentecostal church. I'm not dissing Pentecostals, but uh, in their youth group, it was a mega church. Like they they did a lot of activities in the community and stuff. And in their youth group, they were very emphatic that whenever they did something in the community, that it was like a miracle had to happen because they had to prove that that God existed and that God was active in the world. And like, they would share stories like how they had people, you know, encounter like miraculous healings and and stuff like that. Um, And it was almost taken. I think it is a common idea or at least common enough that people would be surprised if I said this, that if God performed more miracles, then more people would believe. Um, And I'm simply not convinced by that argument. And actually C.S. Lewis, I think gives a good, uh, illustration of this in his book, The Great Divorce, where uh, there's a person who um, is sort of visiting heaven. I'm, I'm really summarizing a lot of the points here, but a person who is essentially visiting heaven and they're just not convinced that what they're seeing is real. Like they're not convinced that it's all reality. They're, they think that they're just dreaming. And uh, one of the solid people who is someone who lives in heaven says, well, what about this? And then all of a sudden he like summons these like dozens of unicorns in this field and and the person is still just like yeah this is just a dream i'm not buying any of this and then the unicorns disappear and for the longest time that was the the craziest reference (laughs) i had no idea what to do with it but then i i think what c.s lewis is trying to articulate is uh this is not a saying people are dumb uh it's just saying even if god performed miracles all the time there's still going to be people who don't believe um, like you could come face to face with the miracle that in and of itself is, is not enough to, to convince some people. Uh, and that's just what it is. So, yeah. So doing that. To yeah. Before, of- just, just before you read the quote, I will say that that is another instance, I think of a specific argument that you could give for why a world where more miracles was done was not a world where more people would be saved. So, Jordan's argument was from this, like, you know, moral good and moral evil, needing to see both is actually more effective for saving people. Your argument there was like, in some sense, you might think that people would uh, either be really stubborn or they might just come to get used to these uh, miracles in a way, or they would write them off all the time. They they would be so, you know, set against the idea of the existence of God. They come up with all kinds of creative ways to write them off. Um, so, but anyway, it's, it, the point is just that those are those are two good instances of arguments for why you might actually think a world with more miracles is not a world that more people are saved. And you can come up maybe with different arguments. That's it, it's up to your creative genius if you want to think about that world. Yeah. No, that's fair. yeah. Thank you, Rick. No, that's really fair. good articulation there. Um, so yeah, I think we tend to see uh, miracles as maybe using as you know evidence. Um, to people that that God exists, maybe convincing them. But yeah, I, I was once listening to a lecture by uh, Dr. Frank Moore, who's the now the general editor of the Church of the Nazarene. Um, he was a professor at Olivet for a while, and I was listening to a lecture from him, and he was discussing the value of uh, Wesleyan theology and the strength of what we believe. And I just this isn't just Wesleyan theology. Um, that was just the context of the lecture. But at one point, he said. Um, you know, the real value of what we're preaching, the real value of what the scriptures talk about, and really the true gospel message is that people can be changed. It's not about these miraculous healings. It's about when people encounter you, they encounter someone who's different than who you used to be. And he says the greatest testimony that the church has, that any Christian has, is for someone to look at them and say, there's just something different about him, or there's just something different about her. That in of itself is probably the most compelling evidence 
uh, that God is real uh, and that God is at work in someone's life um, is, is yeah, just the witness of our own lives and just being who God is, is making us to be. Not even that it has to be a, a conscious thing. Again, we don't have to be aware of it. Like you, Jordan, like someone in your life called it out and says, you're different. You didn't, you didn't realize it, but they did that in and of itself is, is, yeah. is, uh, is a witness, is a witness to it. Yeah. Oh, it's good. Yeah. The story makes me laugh still. Um, <laughs> no, I think that's fair. And, and that, that's just God's work on all its powerful stuff. So some other common errors that we want to get to, um, really smooth transition there, right? Uh, but <laughs> the spirit, uh, can be akin, right? So the spirit is akin to supernatural power. Now this one, you may or may not have experienced a lot. This is one that I have. I actually was, I roomed with a guy for a year, uh, when I was in college that was very Pentecostal, very charismatic. Right. And so for him, like he would go to these, like, I'll, I'll use this phrase loosely. Like I would say school sponsor, they were a club. I don't, I don't actually know if they're all like recognized by all of that or not, but this like group where they would go and essentially they would like speak in tongues and prophesy over each other. And I had a friend who's actually an open and ardent atheist who was at all of that go with my other friend to one of these meetings to be prophesied over because he was just like, well, let's just see what happens. <laughs> but what I found was this, that for, for my friends that were in this group where, where the supernatural power had to work, like that was the, that was, that religious experience was the work of God in their lives. Like they could, they could get through and their hope and their joint was to have these moments where like God is working. Like they, they could only, I don't want to say they could only see through that lens, but I think they struggled to see the world. I, I think they struggled to see God's everyday presence is what I'm trying to say. And so like they needed these dramatic, they don't need it, but they sought these dramatic events because I think that they, they weren't able to understand like who the spirit was because for them, it was, it was really an unhealthy aspect of the relationship itself. Like they were almost like wanting the relationship with the spirit more than they actually wanted the person of who the spirit is. If that makes sense. Like, um, and that's yeah. kind of what Rick and I mentioned earlier, like good theology is a healthy living. And so like, I think you see this play out in a couple of different ways. I think the first way is you see people like this that I'm giving this strong story for. These are your charismatics. I, I have no desire to take digs at charismatics. I am, I'm not one. I'm just open and comfortable saying it. I, I don't feel like that's typically how God speaks. It's never happened to me. I probably don't anticipate it happening to me. Maybe that's the wrong thing to say, but it is what it is. But the second thing is I think that sometimes we think about like supernatural power and I'll say it in slightly more mundane terms, but it is, it is still big. I, th I think in churches specifically, and I th especially in like modern culture, especially nowadays, it, it has to be this like movement, right? And, and I mean, this is like this like momentous church that's growing. Like for, for people who like, I'll just say, you know, I grew up in a church that when I, when I started going to church, it was around 700 people. It peaked at about 1,100 people. So we grew 400 people in about five, six years, and it was awesome. Mm -hmm. To be a part of that growth track and to see a church being live and minister and, like, get involved in its community and to watch people with no deeds and transform and change is an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing to be a part of. But I think what we get in what, as Western church people and as, like, American church people, we get caught up in the why that – if a church is not growing at that rate or like that, they're not doing God's work. Like in the spirit's not present there. Hmm. And one, I think that's unbiblical because where two or more gather in his name, he will be there. Secondly, he's omnipresent. So he's there anyway. <laughs> like, but most importantly, I, I, it's unfeasible to think that that's how that works everywhere. Yeah. You know, Ben, I told you this last week, you are the minister at a small town in Michigan, right? Hmm. How, yep. how many how many people were in that town? Like, do you uh, know? Almost four hundred. I think right. I think my moving there might have pushed it over, but it was just under four hundred. Three hundred and ninety seven or something. Yeah. So by this strict criteria or by this misaligned criteria of like the supernatural power and this like momentous event, right? By this by this errant criteria criteria. Unless you had 400 plus growing members where you're not only in that small town and eating up all the neighboring small towns, like getting everybody to go to your church and like they're all on fire for the 
with the power and passion of Jesus Christ, like then, then you would have failed in your ministry, which I would say is patently absurd. Um, because a lot of times the places that we see this is are these large churches and major metropolitan areas. So they already have natural like demographic and like population base to draw off of. So it's easy to put out figures in a city of like 5 million people of 20,000. Is it easy? No, it's really hard. The minister and the church has to work hard. I'm not saying that their work's not valid. What I'm simply saying is that that's your only criteria for church success and the work of God and the work of spirit in your life. I think you fundamentally missed the bigger point. That however many people at your church in, in that small town in Michigan, Ben, doesn't ha- it doesn't have to be the same thing as Stephen Furtick or you know Rick Warren's church. Like that that wouldn't even be possible. That couldn't happen in your town. There's not, there's not enough people. It's not feasible, right? Yeah. But God's still present there and he's still active and moving. And I, I just think it's a dangerous game to play when we, we think of when we, we put I don't want to say I hate saying that. When we only understand the spirit or when we are too ardent about seeing the spirit in these lens of like momentum, growth, dramatic events, supernatural power. I think that's wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And that was something, uh, a concept I took personal offense to while I was a pastor uh, at that church. Um, it's just sort of this idea that, you know, the, the success of your church needs to be measured by how many miracles you have, uh, how many supernatural experiences that you have, uh, like very dramatic. Um, while I was there, I was there uh, about three years and, um, I don't remember an instance of anyone even really coming to Christ uh, while I was a pastor there. Um, maybe that's a reflection on maybe I was a poor preacher. I don't know. But I, but I would say this is I would be hard pressed to say that that church was anything but a healthy, active participant in the body of Christ. Um, like the people there were genuine. They had gone through life experiences that I can't even imagine. Um, and yet they exhibited uh, kindness and mercy and grace and love in ways that in many of these churches that are very charismatic. And again, I'm not dissing charismatic churches, but <laughs> some of those churches, mm, well, maybe I shouldn't say those in particular, but there are a lot of churches that do not exhibit the things that, that I witnessed at the church that I attended uh, where I was the pastor for, for several years. And, and then sometimes like going to conferences or going to these pastoral meetings where sometimes this is what's discussed, right? Like a critique is uh, like your church is going to fail if you don't see like these particular things that all tend to be like based around charismatic forms of theology. And I was like, well, I don't see those in my church, but, but, but uh, like I, but I didn't use those as the measure for a real church because they're not. Um, the people in my church, man, like I am so proud of them. They they were exceptional. They are exceptional believers. They really do set the example uh, for what it means to be a Christian. And man, a lot of those people really formed who I am, uh, and you know, were, were great role models. Even though I never saw, a, I can't remember seeing a spiritual healing take place, but the spirit's definitely there. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's broader. And you know, Rick, feel free to chime in, man. You know, if you got some thoughts on this. Uh, what I want to say is, um, from my own experience, I'm, I'm not a pastor, but I, I've been involved in youth ministry for a while now. I've been a Christian for a while now, and uh, you guys both know me. I I tend to be really overly rational, overly intellectual, and I would say that uh, for most of my Christian life, I've been extremely skeptical of people who talk about being led by the Spirit because that. It's not something that I ever experienced. And, um, and so I tend to react negatively towards sermons that try to, to pull out that kind of emotional reaction. Um, but I do want to say that over time, I feel like my theology has matured from a place of those people are crazy to those people are different. Mm-hmm. And I, it's a big move for me because for the longest time, I just thought they don't I don't know what they're doing. And it would bother me a lot to see these kind of sermons being preached in the church. And I think that I came to a recognition that the, the body of Christ is so different in so many ways. Um, and so I think that you can err on the side of thinking that the spirit, this, this supernatural power and having services that try to draw out or, motivate that supernatural element of the God's spirit flowing through you and building you up and filling you. Uh, 
But I want to be careful and say that I think you can err on the other side as well. If if me, who hadn't matured in a way to see the importance of the differences in the body of Christ, became a preacher who graduated from college, who got a pastorate, who thought that it, people who thought this way were crazy and that people who said they experienced the Holy Spirit this way, I thought they, they were missing it. They didn't understand that the Spirit didn't work that way. I, I think that if I had gone into a church and preached my way, my style, the way that I learn every week, I would have harmed the congregation. And that's because to do that is simply not to respect the differences in the diversity in the body of Christ. In a big community, I can do that and I can get away with it because there'll be enough people who are similar to me who I would draw into my church mm-hmm. and the church will still function. But um, it's... I think it's an unhealthy thing to do. I think it's the error in the wrong direction. And I think that for me, if I were a preacher, I would have to push myself on a regular basis, whether that's monthly or more, to move to preach in ways that were not in my comfort zone for how the spirit works. And that's because I recognize that there are people in the church body that have diverse ways of experience the Holy Spirit. So it would be important for me to preach more towards this active Holy Spirit in your life, call for him to be in your life right now, even though that's not how I experience the Holy Spirit, I think that I would need to preach that way on occasion in order to present the the working of the Holy Spirit in various ways to my congregation. I think this is also something that churches who are uh, blessed to have multiple pe- uh, speakers are able to do, where you have one person who exemplifies a certain kind of way of their living in the spirit and your way of living in the spirit and having those kind of alternative preachers are able to provide some diversity to the body. So I just want to say we can err in both directions. I think you can be overly logical, overly intellectual to the extent that you actually cut out a movement of the Holy Spirit in your life because you refuse to recognize it. But you can also be overly spiritual to the extent that anytime you start to try to intellectually process what's going on in your faith life, that you immediately cut that out and assume that that's not the Holy Spirit. So again, I just think you can error in both ways. Yeah, that's very true. That's super fair. No, that's yeah. incredibly fair. And I think you touched on our next one. One of our other common misconceptions is that the, the Spirit's manifested, you know, emotionally, or the work of the Spirit is only articulated in emotions. You know, um, and I, I think that's. I think you're. We, we kind of briefly touched on it, and I think it's really good. So we'll just kind of let, let sleeping dogs lie there. Like we've already discussed that one enough. Um, yeah, it's fair. Yeah. I just didn't want to be too off topic, but the spirit. So here's another one though, that we see quite a bit. And I love to hear you guys have to say about this. The spirit is only present once we are saved and or sanctified. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So this one is definitely more of the, I guess, more conceptual. Um, it's hard to articulate how this looks experientially. Um, it's, it's, ex- except for it's, it's really just how it's preached yeah. and taught. Yeah. Um, so there, there are. This is why prevenient grace is so important to talk about because there are schools of thought that say the Holy Spirit is only um, something that we can uh, experience, which is weird because the Holy Spirit is a person. So maybe that's a bad way of putting it. But the Holy Spirit is something we can only have a real relationship with, like once we're saved, or really in more American holiness circles, uh, once we're sanctified. Um, so like once you're saved, oh, well, you don't really have the Holy Spirit yet. That's like step two of your of your Christian walk, which John Wesley uh, absolutely despised. Uh, I think he <laughs> he's even said, uh, I think it's written in one of his sermons. Um, he'd ask people, well, do you have the, is the Spirit indwelling you? And they'd say no. And he's like, okay, well, then you're not a Christian. Uh, <laughs> because he was pretty uh, emphatic that, that once you're saved, once you accept for, uh, Christ's forgiveness, um, you receive the Spirit. Um, as an indwelling presence. Now, this actually goes back to something that we kind of skipped over earlier, uh, which is the significance of Pentecost. Um, so I just want to clarify something here, because uh, this is pretty interesting. So I don't know what you guys were taught growing up or you know, listening what you guys were taught, uh, but I was certainly taught that when God uh, created uh, man, uh, when God was forming man out of the dust, that he breathed life into his nostrils, the man became a living being. And that word used for uh, God breathing life was the word ruach in Hebrew, uh, which means, you know, like spirit, wind. Um, and so for a long time, it was understood that when God breathed life into the man, it was actually God's spirit 
that caused man to become a living being. Uh, so the, the ramifications of that was that when in the garden, when everything was perfect, uh, men and women, you know, Adam and Eve, they could, they, the Holy spirit was an indwelling presence. It was something that was a part of who they, who they were. However, in the Hebrew, that word is actually not used there. Uh, the Hebrew word for uh, breath is is the same word that's used for any living being, like a, a fox or a deer or a, a bear. Uh, like it's a very generic word, um, which carries significant ramifications when you understand that when God breathed life into the man, God did not give Adam his own spirit as an indwelling presence. Uh, he created the man as a living being, certainly, and certainly distinct from the rest of creation. But the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, was not uh, a person that was in work in the life of Adam. It was dis it was distinctly separate, um, which makes Pentecost all that more significant because for the first time in history, not for the second time, for the first time in history, God's spirit could actually dwell within people, which is uh, incredibly significant um now certainly we understand that the spirit is is really only an indwelling presence once we accept christ's forgiveness um and there's there's a lot of uh, theological uh, discussion around that which i, I don't want to get into but really just to say that the spirit is at work in, in everyone's life uh, whether it's through provenient grace or whether as an indwelling presence um, i guess the way i distinguish it is provenient grace is, is god working in our lives sort of as an outside influence um, sort of, you know, working uh, uh, around us, uh, whereas once we're saved, uh, the presence of, of the Spirit is, is within us um, and transforming us. Uh, so really, that's, that's the only point here is, you know, I think we do have to be careful of how we articulate this, because it, it can devolve into saying that uh, there are different stages of Christianity, and there are traditions out there, there are churches out there that teach this, that once you're saved, you don't receive the Spirit, maybe a little bit. You receive a little bit of the spirit, but but you need to like reach this this other tier of Christianity where you yeah. receive the full of the spirit, Super. and which usually ends up manifesting itself in spiritual gifts. Uh, which again, that goes to a different topic, but that we've already touched on. No, no, no I think it's really good. I when you were saying that, I, I just thought of the silly Dragon Ball Z reference. I just thought of Christian Super Saiyans, like you know, <laughs> like, Kyle Ken is like getting saved. Yeah, when you know, after you meet Frieza, it's like, I guess that's like oh your, your sanctifying moment. This is really bad analogy. <laughs> but like, hey, they can be virtuous without Christ. There you go. Um, yeah. I mean, but that, isn't that what you laid out, though? That's perfect, though. That's, that's, that's the most sense.